what do you call it? I think I think the first thing that we should note is that uh, uh, the NEP or the really the NEM is not really a successor of the NEP, mm -hmm. but the successor of the new development policy. Right. Right, that's the right. NEP ended uh, mm. quite a while ago. It was uh, replaced by the NEP and also to some extent with Vision 2020. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I think um, uh, to so harshly judge the the NEP, I think is uh, is a bit uh, is a bit uh, incorrect. Mm -hmm. um, if anything, you could argue that um, where we are today, where we are able to move from what is an, uh, what is considered or acknowledged as a middle income a nation to something that is a high income nation, all that owes in part, in large part, to the NEP. Mm -hmm. um, we could easily have gone down the path of other countries where. Uh, the country as a whole on average saw itself calculated statistically as a middle income country but having much wider income disparity yeah. between the different uh, uh, individuals as well as groups mm -hmm. and that would have led to uh, different types of uh, strife, different challenges. Um, at least in the end, the NEP's aim was to address an imbalance that resulted in a crisis. Okay. And I think uh, seeing as we've had peace for much of the time, and uh, prosperity as well, um, I would say that uh, it would be too harsh to judge the NEP as a failure. Right. Uh -huh. If I can just pick on one point that you said, income inequality. As we know that uh, the UNDP found, uh, found that the Gini coefficient in Malaysia is uh, the second highest in Asia behind uh, Papua New Guinea. So does that mean that, that the NEP has addressed that? If, I, if um, perhaps one cycle wants to address oh, that. Okay. Mm. Uh, the the Gini coefficient and, mm. and inequality. But before that, can, can I uh, yes, uh, address your first question mm. about the NEP? Uh, I agree with you that uh, you, you know in large part we owe where we are today to the NEP, uh, and we must uh, accept that that covers both the successes and the problems mm -hmm. uh, in terms of raising the economic situation, economic uh, uh, you know prosperity of the country. Yes, the NEP has done quite a lot of things. At the same time, the policies, or maybe even the implementation of the policies, have resulted in in uh, uneasiness mm -hmm. uh, amongst people, uh, and with many people complaining about the uh, the, the different treatments within the races. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's not so much about the policy, but it's about the implementation. Mm -hmm. And this is the problem when government tries to socially engineer society, there will be all, there will always be unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. And that's my fear for the NEM. Mm -hmm. uh, coming back to the issue of uh, inequality, yeah. uh, yes, uh, inequality in the country has, you know, has increased. And uh, if you look at the Gini coefficient, it's, uh, mm -hmm. Is increasing. Yes. Uh, that has a, a you know a large part of that that has something to do with the fact that uh, yeah. when the economy was pseudo liberalized before, uh, only certain part of mm -hmm. society benefited from okay. it. You know, if you know people, you will benefit from it. If you don't know people, that's it. Uh, it's not properly liberalized. I think if if we look at the NEM and and try to liberalize properly, then there will be a difference. Uh, but there will always be you know, inequality in society. We, we cannot uh, aim for equality of outcome. You mm. know, give people equal opportunities, mm. the outcome will be different. Mm -hmm. with the, so with the NEM, there's this whole thing, market-friendly affirmative action. Mm. What does that mean? And, and is this actually something that uh, is long overdue to get rid of the whole racial quota? <laughs> no, but I think, I think I'm, I'm actually very concerned about the whole sloganeering around this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, <laughs> Okay, uh, as uh, and uh, I'm I'm very conscious about getting in trouble here, but uh, <laughs> since I'm already here, I'm already in trouble. <laughs> it's too late. Uh, it's too late. Um, uh, you see, um, market-friendly affirmative action is um, to me uh, a bit of a clash in terms mm -hmm. because um, affirmative action uh, indicates uh, a political will. Mm. political will mm. to uh, address societal ills by action mm. and that action has to require a certain measure of power yeah. um, and uh, whereas market friendly uh, in the dogma that we are in typically today of capitalism means really laissez-faire mm. so uh, to say that you will have laissez-faire and have, have something that forces it in the direction which will address societal mm. problems to me 
the elaboration of that uh, will be extremely difficult mm. which is probably why uh, uh, what the prime minister has uh, decided to do is probably quite wise because uh, what i understood was uh, in uh, discussions that we have had because i'm i'm uh, from uh, representing myc to the malaysian mm. association of youth clubs mm. so uh, there were engagements with with uh, certain leaders uh, um, and societal leaders and the feedback given was that uh, Malaysia has evolved into a country that is now more developed that the populace will not uh, necessarily accept anything that is spoon fed mm -hmm. especially after the experiences that we've had over the last five years and the aspirations that we have in the future so a policy which is presented as an idea and hence developed with engagement will probably find some more acceptance what people are not happy about especially the non-Malays and to me even the Malays should be unhappy about this if they know okay. that what, what's being done in the name of article 153 is it's being used carte blanche for cronyism, corruption, nepotism. Mm -hmm. I mean do people not see that? No one argues with article 153 in its original concept and to a large extent I dare argue that article 153 objectives have been achieved by the NEP. Uh, ironically, NEP, I think, has even encouraged competition, made Malaysians more competitive. Let me explain. The non-Malays feel pressured because obviously there's less for them than in the free-for-all situation. So they have to work harder, they have to try harder. The Malays, Bumi Putras, they are also more competitive because they are told and they've been told you know, the first 20 years and even subsequently that there are all these opportunities for you, go and grab them. Don't say that, you know, you haven't had a chance, that it's not a level playing field, blah, blah. And to a large extent, the Malays have done that. Mm -hmm. So I get very upset when fringe politicians still saying that Malays need to be protected, there's no level playing field. If the Malays are not protected, they'll be swamped, they will lose the country. Mm -hmm. Really rubbish. The reason why they were upset was because uh, when uh, the NEM was talked about uh, in the closed uh, doors, uh, some people were saying it is a replacement of the NEP mm -hmm. and the NDP because those policies were a failure. Mm -hmm. um, to them, it's very emotive mm -hmm. to say that okay. these were failures. Mm -hmm. Was it a failure and was it wrong then that we actually seek affirmative action with the ways that we were done? Mm -hmm. And of course, it was appalling to them to think that people were putting words in our Prime Minister's mouth mm -hmm when the NEP was formed when his father was Prime Minister, mm -hmm. you know, for, mm -hmm. for Malay, that would be like, you know, mm -hmm. such a such a betrayal. Mm -hmm. but, but and, see, uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm not upset with uh, the points that they are raising. Mm -hmm. I am upset because they claim to represent Malays. I am a Malay. Mm -hmm. He does not represent me. Mm -hmm. you, you know, he does not represent all Malays. Right. Who give him the right to speak for the Malays? Ultimately, he is a politician who keeps jumping from one place to another, trying to find a political place for himself. Mm -hmm. So he does not speak for the Malays. The Malays are confident people who can compete anywhere.